And the people of God said, Amen. That's really the appropriate response to these things that we love so much is the great Amen. But I assume that's what we mean when we clap. So we are uh, in the thick of summer, aren't we? It is here. And um, I had something happen to me yesterday that has never happened to me before in my life, in my whole life. I was stung by a hornet. Man, so so if the sermon's not so good, it's just because I'm feeling a little lightheaded from that from that hornet. So yeah. So uh, we continue, we've got today and next Sunday, we'll wrap up looking at Micah and uh, 1 Corinthians 13. You'll find those uh, on the back of your, of your bulletin, uh, and also for you to pick up, if you're using them, if you found them helpful, uh, they're hung on the website, but also a, a daily devotional guide to accompany this uh, series. There should be out there and out here, and that's where I picked mine up. Um, I will read from 1 Corinthians and then ask us once more to read together the passage from Micah. But hear now these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. 
Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. And let us read together Micah 6, 8. But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It is quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and love in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Really, that um, to take God seriously is really what last, the last couple of Sundays and today and next Sunday is about. That if we take God more seriously than we take whatever is happening out there, then we will stay focused. We'll keep the main thing the main thing. And maybe, just maybe, our light will shine more brightly than any darkness that there is beyond these doors. The last few Sundays, we've been taking a look at Micah and Corinthians, and I've been asking the question in so many words, can, can, can love really be the starting point of leadership? I mean, could, could we see something kind of like that hanging in the governor's mansion or in the Oval Office? Can love really be the starting point of leadership? We may lead from the heart within the safety of these walls, but what about out there in the real world? And we distinguished last week that, you know, it's not us and them. We are a part of that world, that real world. The question is how, what is reflected in us when we, when we go out there? I suggested to you, based on what we see on the news and read in the papers, that the state of our world is one that is becoming less civil, or at least it seems to be. We seem to be trading in our civility and putting in its place suspicion. And suspicion always leads to divisiveness, and divisiveness out there can spill into here, into our churches. I've not seen that at Wells. Thanks be to God. But there are a lot more churches than just Wells. The divisiveness out there can spill into our churches in here. Or, and this is the whole point of this series, the heart and love in our church, in here, can spill out and into the world. And maybe the world can begin to reflect the things that we hold dear. The first Sunday of this series, I asked the question, as followers of Jesus, what is the condition of our hearts? What do our hearts reflect <clears throat> do they reflect the state of the nation, or is it possible that the state of the nation might be able to reflect the condition of our hearts, given the conditions are good? We may think that to be a good citizen, one must obey the laws of the land, pay our taxes, vote, and that's true. These are at least some of the ways to be a good citizen, but if we want to be great Citizens, I want to be a great citizen. If we want to be great citizens of this nation, not merely good, do you know what we need to do? Do you know what the real secret is to being a great citizen? Now, you might want to write this down. It's complicated. Practice our faith. If we want to be good citizens of this nation, we do all of the things accorded a citizen. But if we want to be great citizens of this nation, practice our faith. 
God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Love never dies. We know only a portion of the truth. We have three things to do. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of these three is love. Practice your faith. Practice our faith. Peterson translates uh, from Micah to love kindness. He translates that uh, to compassion. And to be compassionate means, among other things, concern and distress over the suffering of others. But here's the catch. For followers of Jesus, it means concern and distress over the suffering of others combined with a desire to alleviate that suffering. That's our job. It's not enough to simply have pity on, it's to have empathy and then ask ourselves this question, what am I going to do about it? For followers of Jesus, we must always look through the, through the lens of what part do I play? What is my role? And what would Jesus have me to do in this situation? And I'm not talking about big, outlandish, great acts of faith that take time and money. And I mean, maybe, but it could be the small thing. It could be the rededication to practice our faith. Now, make no mistake about it, there is so much good in this world and in this nation. Y'all have heard me use the term glory sightings before, and I promise you, every single day, I see at least four or five things that I can attribute to nothing other than God. And in those things, I see the glory of God. And that's when I'm not paying attention. What if I paid attention? What if I was really paying attention? If I paid close attention every day, I believe there would be countless glory sightings. So I don't want you to hear that it's all doom and gloom out there. It isn't. Right, Poppy? <laughs> Not anymore. But we have to admit that there is a lot of divisiveness incivility and just downright meanness. I've checked out of Facebook for a while, as you know, but I still read the paper. I still watch the news. So I'm not suggesting that we turn off uh, CNN or Fox or MSNBC. Don't cancel your subscription to the Clarion Ledger or Time or Newsweek or the New York Times, whatever your, your pleasure is. I know we get tired of seeing the hard stuff, the embarrassing stuff, but those secular outlets help keep us informed. And as a people of God, we want to be informed. They keep us informed, and it's good to be informed, but if we are going to be engaged in that affirmation, if we're going to be a information. If we're going to be engaged in that information, then I want to invite us to engage that information in a new way. Not in the way that we see most folks doing it. Easy way is just to get frustrated and mad and stamp our feet and we've got the right answer if somebody would just listen to us. No, I want to invite us as followers of Jesus in the midst of hard times to put on a new pair of glasses. That's a metaphor, of course. Just put on a new pair of glasses. In other words, we've got to see all of this around us through a new lens. But the funny thing is, that lens, it's not new at all. It's been around for thousands of years. We just maybe need a little reminder that that's the lens we look through. On our best days as followers of Jesus, we do see life through this lens. 
And lately, though, I, I'm, this is my concern, lately it is an incivility that I have seen spill into the church. And that's church with a big C, uh, not just Wells. It's not incivility that I have seen spill over into the church. It is despair. There is a place for despair. It helps us to, whether we like it or not, peel back the layers and, and really see the hard things, but that same despair can paralyze us. That same despair in any situation of life, it can be a symptom of losing hope. And followers of Jesus... We never lose hope. Micah tells us to love kindness, to be a compassionate people, to see the suffering and then to seek to alleviate the suffering. If we look to the call to compassion through our everyday, ordinary eyes, then, then we will despair. It is almost guaranteed. But Paul reminds us that faith Hope and love remain. These three. Peterson translates it to, uh, to hope unswervingly. Now let me tell you a little bit about that word hope. It's not the same thing as the word wish. We can wish for something on our birthday and blow out the candles and that wish may or may not come true, but to hope in something, according to the New Testament, is to have confidence and faith that that for which we hope will happen. It's not a wish. It's an expectation. We know it will happen because we have faith and trust and unswerving hope. The Greek word for hope out of the New Testament is elpis. And translated, it means expectation of what is sure, expectation of what is certain. When the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. We must not lose hope, and we must know that the guaranteed the guarantee of that which we hope for makes compassion a possibility in the first place. And that is leading from love and leading from the heart. When the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. Maybe that's what we are feeling out there, incompletes. When the complete arrives, when the complete arrives, the household of God on this earth, the incompletes, everything that causes despair and loss of hope will be canceled. Let it be so on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.